الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وآله وصحابه أجمعين. So our little uh, semester has come uh, to a close. This is our final uh, meeting for this semester. Allah Azza wa allow us to implement everything we learned up to this point. Uh, so that's the most important thing. It's not just uh, learning about and sitting in these kind of lectures. It's to ask yourself, what can I do to implement from something that I learned? Because otherwise, this becomes a knowledge that is held against you uh, rather than for you on the Day of Judgment. That should also not discourage you to not go to any Islamic lectures because then you're going to sit there and say, well, why would I sit there and get all these things held against me? And then I'm just, you know, I'm better off being ignorant. And you learn very clearly in the Quran that Allah Azzawajal will not accept uh, blatant ignorance as an excuse on the Day of Judgment. So it's still incumbent on you to attend these lectures. And then it's more incumbent upon you to act upon them so that you could get closer to Allah. That's one of the most important things that I hope uh, we get. And we, we took a long range of things from uh, being just with one another, not oppressing people. Uh, we talked about friendship. We talked about, uh, um, about the tricks of shaitan and how he gets people to uh, fall into that disaster. We also went into you know, some of the prophets. We learned from Adam alayhi salam. Just a brief, like literally, the, the little lecture we did on Adam will probably cover one in a thousand of the amount of uh, lectures you could cover on Adam, alayhi uh, salam. And you learn a lot of things there, how to deal with siblings, sibling rivalry, jealousy, things like that. The fitna of uh, the opposite gender, the fitna of uh, musical instruments and how it ruins the heart. Don't forget that. Um, and we also learned about sheath and the things that lead to zina which is uh, fornication and adultery. Uh, it's all sorts of things that it, it, it comes in steps. Don't forget, you know, it's not like somebody who is listening to the radio on their way to school is automatically going to fall into zina. No, they listen to it here and there. They like it so much. Then they say, you know what? My CD broke. If they're even still using that CD, I don't know what they're using now. I mean, the iPod now or your phone. Everybody's using the phone, right? So they use that, and then that didn't work for some reason. So they go on YouTube, then they see the music video, then they see these lucrative dancers, then they get, you know, that gets locked into their brain, and then that just leads. You see, it's just a, it's a, just a downward spiral effect that the shaitan tried. The last uh, topic that we're going to talk about today, bi and we'll leave a little bit of time for Q and A if we if we have that ability, is the Prophet Ayub alayhi salam, and that's a job in English. And the, it's interesting, the reason that we, I, I thought to go over AU, one, because it's not that long, so it's not like there's a to be continued, if you will. Um, and AU is mentioned four, four times in the Quran. And in one hadith in Bukhari, which is uh, extremely, uh, you know, the highest level of authenticity. And then in some narrations, they're acceptable. And then in other narrations are absolutely weak. Uh, are not absolutely, are weak, debated, and then the f final bottom category are uh, fabricated, actually. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an entire science of hadith, ulm al-hadith, uh, ulum al-hadith, which is the scholars of the, that they study the narrations, uh, they are able to determine certain things like that. And you can see how it kind of just doesn't make sense anyway. Uh, and Ayub kind of relates to a lot of us in a sense, especially living in America and especially living in Jersey. And you may not have thought about it because you, know, you probably know Ayub's background, which is that he was very wealthy. He had, a lot of, um, uh, he had a lot of offspring, he had a lot of children. He had, um, he had a few wives and he was just a very well off individual. Not that he cared for any of it, but more importantly, the most uh, important blessing of all that Allah Azzawajal gave him was prophethood. Being a prophet actually is the most, uh, <laughs> the highest blessing that, uh, that uh, anyone could have received. And that, that, uh, that is in and of itself the best thing that ever happened to him. But nonetheless, uh, the reason that I say that is because all of those things were stripped from him. One by one, his wealth, his family, his health, right? And then after that, he had to survive. He had to make it. And the, the question that I ask ourselves, including myself, is could you survive if everything in your comfort zone today was taken from you? And if you pause for a second, I'm talking about no car. I'm talking about no bus, no public transportation. 
Uh, no running water. Running water. You know that little thing that you just push on and off for the up and down handle? That little ease? That is a nama beyond belief. No electricity. No oven. Dick, 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 dick. Fire. None of that. Would you actually be able to survive? How many people would die just because they wouldn't figure out how to, how to cook for themselves or something like that? What if there's no meat store for you to just go and purchase a pound of uh, uh, food and then go cook it at home? Where do you get food from? How do you even hunt? What on earth are you talking about hunting? Well, how would you live? You start eating grass? I mean, some people are doing that right now. May Allah just protect us because, you know, like for example, if you go to some, some countries in, uh, that the situation that they're dealing with is such of great famine, um, and I know this because my father's aunt is married to um, someone from Yemen and they told him that and you've seen it first person that they actually eat grass They actually eat grass because there's nothing else left to eat Actual grass. They actually just eat it That's scary business right there And so you ask yourself then what and I'll never forget this by the way. How many of you have made Hajj? Umrah the visit? Okay. Did you go to Mecca or you went to Medina first? Or you didn't go to Medina? You didn't go to Medina? Oh, you did? You went to Mecca or Medina first? Okay, you went to Medina first. So, just so you know, what we, what, when we were in our group, you know that long bus ride? A couple hours. It's long. So, some of us, when we did We thought that was going to go well. That didn't go well at all. The problem was we tried it in Mecca before we get on the bus because we figured it's a long ride. We'll rest so we have our strength. Because, you know, when you get to the Prophet's Masjid, every prayer is a thousand prayers. Best thing you could do in the Prophet's Masjid is pray. The best thing you could do in the uh, uh, in Masjid al-Aqsa is pray. The best thing you could do in Masjid al-Haram is tawaf. See? Actually, is to, to circumambulate uh, the uh, Kaaba, right? This is the best thing because Allah just said it. Taifin al 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 sujud. The people who are making tawaf, the people who are making the itikaf, the people who are doing uh, salat. So he put that kind of tertib. So if there is space and it's not very crowded, like Hajj season, uh, then just as much as your legs can bear, keep on making tawaf. Best thing you could do. So anyhow, we're, we're thinking, let's get our strength. We're going to go over there. The problem is, is the, there's no rest stops. Like, literally no rest stops. It's not like a gas station. The gas station, you get gas and you leave. There's no such thing as get yourself a rest stop. So we find this rest stop, and, and it was like kind of remote. Problem is probably the most disgusting thing you have ever seen in your entire life, I promise you. The remains of the last 20 people before you are still there. There's no toilet. There's no flush thing that you're looking for. You know that nice, beautiful porcelain white thing that's got bleach all over it and 99.9% .9 killing germs? Oh, this is the complete opposite there. Imagine that completely removed. There's just this little wooden door. No light. No light, kid you not. That's where your iPhone better be charged. You know? You got to think of the battery pack. This, you gotta, it's, it's some planning. It's some, it's, it requires some planning, I'm telling you. And, all right, and then, and then, it's just a little hole. It's not even deep. I wish it was deep. I did went to camp up in Frost Valley. The Senate does that. I don't know if any of you are on student government. That, that, at least that's a hole. That's like a 20-foot hole. You look down there. It's like, right, and it echoes. This is no hole. This is like a foot deep, and it's just the remains of the last people were there. It's purely disgusting. And you really got to go. You don't have a choice. Then what do you do? Oh, oh, oh you're looking for napkins probably. Yeah, there's no napkin. So I'm trying to tell you that this is this is important stuff. When I saw this, I had to walk back down. And and by the way, I'm warning you: do not try to get all authentic and American and tourism on me. You do not try their food. It's fine. It's their food. Try it here. Don't try it there. It's really gonna mess you up. It's not your stomach's not ready for that. I don't know what it is, but it's just something. Maybe it's very organic. I don't know. It's a good thing. But I'm telling you that it's a problem and survived I taught these people a little trick with the water bottle by the way so make sure you got yourself a water bottle and uh, I'm, I'll be very serious with you how we did it 
and then we'll go back to this. I, I got out. This was purely disgusting. First of all, we got to pray, right? Uh, we already did Gemma, so we got some because we were traveling. But so what I did, we took a pinhole, and uh, this was where it was a benefit. My mother was with me. I took her pin from her scarf, and I stabbed the top of the bottle. And so essentially, you use it as a, a, a super soaker or a blaster. You guys are predating myself with a super soaker. That's an old water gun back in the day that would, you know, so with a lot of pressure, you clean yourself that way. Um, and so then you sit here, and why am I telling you this? Because there were three people that really, they were about to just go on themselves. They couldn't figure out what to do. And so you, it's about survival. What if all these blessings of the transportation, the way you eat, the way you sleep, a little flick of a light, you got electricity. What if all of that was taken from you? Number one, how are you going to react? That's the most important thing. And number two, how do you survive? So this is a skill that you should uh, start trying to train yourself to understand. As far as Ayub goes, there, here are some regenerations just so that we know. Some of the scholars called him Al-Rumi. Al-Rumi. Uh, in particular, um, Al-Waqi'i and Al-Sabari, they said his name is also Al-Rumi because he was a prophet and he was in the area of Europe, in the area of Rome. There's nothing authentic about that. Scholars, this is Allahu Alam. What we do know for a fact that in every single nation was given a prophet. So that's that. So we definitely know there were prophets out in Rome at one point. There were prophets in India. I mean, at one, uh, Ibn, Ibn Kathir is of the opinion that Buddha, Buddha, you know, the Buddhist thing guy that they worship today, they actually believe he actually said Buddha actually was a prophet. Uh, and then they made bid'ah and they changed the religion of Islam to what it is today, where they have over a million gods. Um, so now. One, um, his, if he was from the area of Europe or not, it doesn't change anything. Here is another uh, false weak narration. It's that he was given cattle and goats and children and wives, and at least had at one point a place in the seventh heaven. He had this place in the seventh heaven that he could visit from time to time. You see, it's already se seeming a little shady. The same like, what's going on here? What do you mean? He's hotel for the night what do you mean the seventh heaven he's got this place here and apparently that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, he, asked Iblis, he said were you able to get to my servant Ayub were you able to get to my servant Ayub so he says if you give me control of his surroundings he tells Allah if you give me control of his surroundings I'll get to him so Allah Azza wa Jal allows Iblis to have control of his surroundings what does he do kills them off one by one if you will, all of his family, except essentially for his one of his wives. Um, and so he passes that test, obviously, uh, by you know, the rest of the story. However, that is an extremely weak narration. Some scholars even mentioned it was fabricated. There's another story which you probably heard of, is that when he was, because um, when his health was taken away, he had this kind of disease where, uh, I don't know if there's any uh, pre-med students or any here, uh, but there's a disease where it was, it was like maggots or worms would grow out of his skin. Not ringing bells? Is ringing a bell? We know what that is? Something? But if we know about it. So that's, that's some scary business. Well, then, then what happens is this little maggot worm falls out from his body. You decides, oh, that can't. Little maggot, your disc is over here. He puts him back in. What kind of business? I mean, what's going on here? You know, people. That's just you know. You don't put him back in. He says, "This is your, this is your disc." I you know. I mean, you know, and to and that's why, Alhamdulillah, we have scholars who, who look at the authenticity, look at the chains of narrators, and they say, uh, "Who's who?" If broken chain, if there's somebody who's known to be a liar, if there's somebody who's known to be forgetful, and they're the weaknesses of different types. Obviously, somebody who was very, very smart, not very, very keen in his brain, in his memory, in the beginning of his life, and then towards the end of his life, he became forgetful, and he narrated something towards the end of his life, and so they considered it weak in that narration. That level of weakness is not somebody who's known as a liar his whole life. You follow? So when there's the chain... Uh, in the, of the narration, this person who narrated, 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 and this guy here was known, or this girl, this individual was known as a pure liar, and this becomes a, a, a weak hadith. That's not the same level. So you see, they also have different levels of why something was weak. 
You understand that? So taking and benefiting from this particular one where somebody was t uh, tending to be forgetful, had the tendency to be forgetful towards the end of their life, is a lot better than taking it from a guy who was known to be a liar his entire life. You could see that, obviously, right? Uh, alhamdulillah. And just so you know, this concept of Isnad is the only, con this uh, concept of Isnad, only the religion of Islam on the face of this planet has today. There's no other religion or faith practicing today that has this concept of this mad where they have an authentic chain of people verified about those people all the way back to the person who claimed to have said it. Doesn't exist, right? The best thing that some of them have was a color-coded Bible. And that's no longer in print, obviously, because that confused a lot of Christians. I think at one point in the United States, 80,000 Christians were converting a year. Um, uh, and that's, I think, I don't know if that was worldwide or in the U.S., I can't remember. But the reason is because if you go back to that print and you look at red, uh, the red was supposed to be the statements that they had known from their biblical scholars that Jesus had said. And never in a red statement said, uh, is uh, Jesus. God. So that was problematic. For them. Anyhow. Uh, so, so what we learned from is that Allah Azza wa Jal tested him. So what was the test from, did we say? Was it from Iblis? Yes or no? Was Iblis given control over his stuff, surrounding? We said that was weak. So then what's the test from? Allah. From Allah. And the evidence behind that is the Prophet Sallallahu he said that Allah tests his servants more they have Iman. The more they have iman, the more the test they get. So obviously, that's the reason you look at all the prophets and the, and the tests that they went through. But we would most likely fail those tests. We would not survive. Man, if we, I'm talking about the bathroom experience. Until this day, we're never forgetting that experience. That's just one iteration of if we lived 60 years, Allah wa'an, we could die tomorrow. But if there was 60 years in that little 10 minutes, you know, without our technology, Here, the Prophet ﷺ mentions about uh, how he tested Ayyub. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, how long did he stay in that illness? Because the final thing, after he was taken away his wealth, after he was taken the sanctuary away of his, uh, his children, his family, then his sickness. Then he started to get very, very sick, very ill. Um, and so the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, the scholar said he was either in that state of sickness with that uh, fitna for 18 years, 40 years, or 70 years. If we were to just take the smallest one, let's go with 18 years for argument's sake, because it seems that the scholars mentioned that 18 seems to be the strongest opinion. The Prophet ﷺ said that you stayed in this condition for 18 years. The problem with this hadith, it's debated about its authenticity, but not to the level of rejected or weak. So, uh, uh, stayed in this condition for 18 years, and everyone around him left. Essentially, that's where you find who your friends are. Your friends are your friend. Through, through thick, through thin, through wealth, through poor, your friends are your friends. You know, you became president of the United States, your friends are still your friends. You became, uh, I don't know, um, uh, the custodian? Awesome, no problem. Great to storm anywhere. Your friends are still your friends. They don't judge you by who and what you have. Uh, and yet, every, all of the people around him left him. Uh, and so one time, one of Ayub's best friends, one of Ayub's best friends, um, said Ayub must have made he heard him saying while he was visiting him he heard him he heard him saying Ayub must have made a sin like no one else Other, otherwise Allah would not have done this to him wow now now you know some people where they try to motivate kids and boost their confidence where they say you know sticks and stones may break my bones and and uh, and words will never hurt me that whole business words do hurt Words really, really do hurt, and especially when they come from people who are closest to you. And th so they could be a very great benefit, and they could be a very uh, detrimental feelings. They could hurt you very much. In this case, that hurt him. That you've known me all my life, and you uh, and you're sitting here saying that I must done, have done I must have done a sin that's like no other person has ever done, and that's why Allah is doing. So Ayyub is uh, that hurt him very much. The Prophet said, he said, upon hearing this, 
Ayyub said, he said, all I know, this is what he says. He says, all I know is that I never passed two people in his uh, ummah. He said, I never passed two people except that they, and they were having a disagreement, an argument with, uh, with one another, and they swore by Allah. Upon a lie. They're lying. So they, you know how some people, they get into arguments, and they say, Wallahi, you're a liar. Wallahi, it was this. Wallahi, it was this. Just take it easy. You don't need to use all that. He says, he sees them. They're arguing, and they're swearing upon a lie. He said, except that I rushed. I went back, and I ran home, and I get sadaqa, to, and I donated sadaqa on their behalf. For their sin, for mentioning Allah upon a lie. That's to the level that he cared about everyone. So you're talking about you, a sin that he's done like no other person, yet he's sitting here looking after the sins of other people. You guess what the, his analogy is? He's, saying, he's saying, you're criticizing me for, and you don't even have any evidence. So that's the oppression. When you're going to criticize someone for something and you have no evidence for you're oppressing them. So he said, you're sitting here saying that and yet I always try to People doing a sin, and I try to ask Allah Azza to forgive them for their sin. And you're sitting here telling me I'm, I'm the prophet of Allah Azza and I, I sin, and that hurt him very much. So, um, and so some of the scholars even said that uh, then later on he found that the pro that uh, his wife came back. His wife came back after she went from us. Says why? Because they also got very very poor, extremely poor. To the extent, I'm telling you, I, may Allah protect us from this. I really don't think we, mu we would survive. To, to look after her, her and her husband with whatever they had left in order to survive, Ayyub's wife goes to the marketplace and she sells her hair. She sells her hair just to get some funds for them to live. So Ayyub got very upset with that. That hurt him. That hurt him very much. That she's even uh, doing that. Big thing. Uh, I know uh, some. You know, it's it's a it's a pretty big thing, girls. And you can you can ask them about the you know their their hair. It's a, it's a big deal. And she just went and sold it so that they could survive. And then she saw Ayub in a very very bad state. I mean, he was just getting it wasn't getting any better. So she, and and throughout these entire eighteen years, Ayub did not ask Allah once. Oh Allah, please please cure me. Because why? He was satisfied with whatever Allah Azza gave him. And he would constantly say, Alhamdulillah. So one time his wife gives him advice. He, she gives him advice. She says, you know, oh my husband, oh Ayyub, why don't you ask Allah Azza wa to give you, uh, to cure you from this sickness? Why? All of the people left him. He didn't have his wealth. He didn't have anything. And then to see somebody with worms and maggots growing out of them, out of their skin, it's pretty tough to sit around. It's, it's tough. So they could have left for some dunyawi reason, then they could have left for just, they're just wondering, well, I, is this contagious or whatever? You never know. So the, there's many reasons. So he was stripped of all of that. And so here she says, why don't you turn to Allah and ask him for, for uh, shifa, for the cure? Then he said, what did you say? You say anything wrong here? I, I, I mean, you asked me, I didn't hear it. So he says, he says, for that statement that you said, if Allah gives me a cure, cures me from this state, I'm going to beat you a hundred times for that statement. Now everybody's like, whoa, she's going to get it. The thing is, she's not. Because in Islam, you're not allowed to hit your wife. That's 100% agreed upon. It's not allowed to hit your wife. And so what, so what happens is, you finally, what does he say to Allah? Allah Azza mentions it in Surah, uh, do I have the reference? Let me see. I'll get you the Surah. But Allah Azza mentions in the Quran, He says, وَذْكُرْ عَبْدِنَا أَيُوبِ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِي الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ That he says, O oh Allah, and remember our, our servant uh, Job Ayyub, when he cried to his Lord, O oh Allah, Behold, Satan has afflicted me with much hardship and suffering. Look at the etiquette that Ayyub, look at the etiquette that Ayyub uh, uh, makes dua to Allah. This was his dua to cure him from his sickness. That was it. But what we know is Allah nifti. Oh, oh Allah, give me a cure. Oh Allah, give me a cure. That's what we say. Ayyub says, Oh Allah, that this shaitan has 
has afflicted me with some hardship and he's afflicted me with this pain because it is not from the etiquette of a Muslim to attribute anything bad to Allah. It's not from the etiquette of a Muslim because the Prophet he said nothing bad happens to a Muslim. Nothing. You will find khair in all of it. So what is he saying? He's saying the shaitan is over here and he's uh, playing with my head. He started, you know, wasa things like that and my uh, health dot dot dot. He's attributing his hardship to the shaitan. So then, because um, Nusul is a kind of waswasa, the scholar said. When the, the Ayyub said, Nusul bin Wa'adab, Nusul bin is a kind of waswasa. That just keeps messing with his head. I mean, 18 years, 40 years by another opinion, 70 years in another opinion, 18 years of this suffering. We can't even bear a day without going with more. deal with any pain we have zero tolerance for pain today nothing which is really bad by the way because there's a there's a, a book i think it's called the plasticity of the brain very important uh i never read it it's on my, it's on my to-do <laughs> list i know you're all thinking like well what, what chapter tell me no i can tell you though that part of it um i i, I know certain essays from it uh, that has been referenced by some of my teachers but so it's on our to-do list maybe during the uh, winter break the plasticity of the brain, that the more that we keep on shutting down our senses, the worse off our body is. And this, and this guy um, who, who authored this book, this individual, they said that, for example, the, the amount of receptors in the foot, in the human foot, are so, uh, uh, are so significant to the way that the body functions, um, but we're, we, we've shut down that part in our He actually argued that because we're constantly wearing socks and shoes, like ask yourself, so honestly, when was the last time you stepped out of the house barefoot? You don't have to answer. I'm not trying to figure out who takes the garbage at 6 a.m. I'm trying to tell you, when was the last time you actually stepped out, walked around the backyard or whatever, and you walked around barefoot? And she said that the receptors in the foot have so much effect on It sends those, uh, the, the, those um, signals to the brain to react a certain way. And that's why we have to sit there, throw the hoodie, the this, the this, the this. Because uh, if we had just walked barefoot for a second, it would prepare you for that. You don't have to walk barefoot to work, I'm saying. I'm just saying, you know, if you read the book, someone read the book and, and bring us some feedback next uh, semester. But, so here's something interesting. So he says that to his wife, that if you, uh, for the statement that you have said, I'm going to beat you a hundred times. And you'll see what that uh, result was. And you'll see how from the beginning of time till the end of time, uh, beating uh, is not acceptable. Okay? Which we'll explain now. So then Allah Azza wa Jal commands Ayyub, commands Ayyub, stomp your foot on the earth uh, and you will find it a cool water to wash with and drink. Right? He tells him that because he can't move. That's how much his... He can't get up. So he says, just hit the, hit the earth like this. Oh, Ayyub, Allah answered it. Hit the foot and you'll find it gushing water. And it will be the water that will be a cure for you. It's essentially wash away all of your sickness from you. And so he did that. And the Prophet wasallam said that after this happened and he was cured, that Ayyub was actually taking a bath. He was showering. And he wasn't wearing any clothes. He was naked. So Allah Azza wa Jal started raining on him golden locusts. Golden, made of dhahab. Golden locusts to uh, wash him and cover him. Um, and so they began to fall on him. So Ayyub started collecting them with his clothes. He started getting his clothes and collecting them. And so Allah Azza wa Jal addressed Ayyub. He said, oh Ayyub, haven't I given you enough so that you are not in need of them? I'm not giving you enough that so that you're not in need of them getting all of these things back. So Ayyub said, yes, so Allah, by your honor and by your might, I, I cannot get enough of your blessing. That's how much he loved the blessings of Allah. This is a miracle of Allah. And he's saying that I would, I, how I can't get enough of your blessing. 
So then Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, in the following verse, He commands him, and He said to Ayyub, so that he can fulfill his oaths, because the mu'min always fulfills their oaths. Always. He made an oath, he made a vow, that if he would get better, he would beat his wife a hundred times. Is beating your wife in Islam allowed? No. I need everyone on that page. No. Oh, no. alright, good. Somebody walk away while I need Good, same page, right? No? All right, so... Allah Azza says, take in your hand a bundle of uh, uh, brushes or uh, twigs, if you will. Uh, or leaf blades. In another narration, Jibreel comes to him and he says, uh, this is the end of the Quran, but the explanation is Jibreel comes to him and tells him, take 100 leaf blades, grass blades. You know? He says, put them together. And he said, do not break your oath. He said, strike her with it. So you take it. Like literally, uh, you know, here, I hit you a hundred times. And that's so that he could fulfill his oath. De, in, in a, a Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he said that when Allah Azza mentions in the Quran about the steps that, um, you know, a, couple, a, a man should take when his wife is extremely um, a bad, very like cursing and, and violent and all this stuff, because it could come from the other side, that there's steps. Allah gave steps in the Quran of what you should do to repair that. Um, relationship because you always want to try to repair it and uh, make sure to try to let it work. The final stage where Allah Azza says, uh, that so hit them or strike them, what that means is more of an emotional type of strike. As Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said, for example, you know, uh, at the time the men used to wear a shawl, like um, a head covering, you know, almost looks like the woman's scarf today, but if it's not uh, tied up, you know, the ones that they. Oh, Saudi king wears, you know him? You know that guy? So if he said that striking your wife, the most you could do is you take that and you go like this. <laughs> I swear, that, I'm not kidding. That's in our... our that, that's what somebody will admit. And the evidence behind that is how Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that. How? That one time, and, and I'm not going to go, it's a long narration. Aisha, she, she kind of wanted to, she was kind of... Not really spying, but kind of watching where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going. In the middle of the night, he comes back. She tries to rush home before he comes back and saw that she was... And, he, and she says, oh, you're back, Ya Rasulullah. She tries to hug him. And he says, stop, oh, Aisha. He goes like that. Literally just stops her. And he didn't hurt her or anything. Aisha, radiallahu anha, she says, I still remember that day. That feeling on my chest, his hand. It's not like she's bruised for life, people. Right? We recognize that. What, it's like an emotional thing. Because the Prophet never did anything like that. He said, no. He said, oh, Aisha, you don't trust me? This is why you're following me in the middle of the night? So see, there's a lot of benefits you could learn from that. Uh, especially in relationships and things like that. So, we know for a fact of Ayyub السلام, still displaying that perfect adab, that perfect um, uh, display of character to Allah Azza wa Jal. He didn't complain, oh Allah, why did you know some people, they say, why me, why me, why me? This is a very bad thing and could lead to very destructive uh, iman. For example, and if you want to think about how you're in a better state Here's something interesting. One time the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he came home and Aisha radiallahu anha, she was telling him, radiallahu anha, she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have, a, I have a, like a, a bad headache, a migraine. What does he say to her? He said, oh Aisha, I have a migraine. Why did he say that? Is it one of those things where your wife comes home and she says, you know it took me six hours to clean this house? Like Habibti, I worked for 14 hours straight. Is this competing? No. Because we know that the sickness of a prophet is like 10 times worse than a person, a normal person. Than the, a person who's not a prophet. Because the prophet is a normal person, so that's the wrong description. A, per, a non-prophet. Like for example, when the Prophet وسلم, he was on his deathbed and he was sick, one of the companions touched him, they said it's as if I was touching boiling water. Went like that and touched him. That is, that is some business right there. You talk about 101.1 fever, you check that thing out, they probably just bust the, the, ther the thermometer right there. And here, the Prophet وسلم, is when he gets a headache it, or a migraine, it is not like our headache, right? So you can imagine. So then Aisha recognized, okay, alhamdulillah. And that's to tell yourself that when you uh, have um, a sickness or you, something befell you, some type of uh, fitna, then the Prophet وسلم, he told us, look at the people who are worse off than you. So if you think you got a migraine, 
go look at somebody who's, uh, you know, I don't know, who's uh, missing an arm. Go look at somebody who can't walk. Go look at somebody who's this. Go look at somebody that. And then you'll say, you know, alhamdulillah, I'll deal with this migraine thing. I'm okay. Because it, it makes you say, Alhamdulillah, when you see there's somebody worse off than you. And you'll always find somebody worse off than you. May Allah Azza wa always give us good health and Iman. That's the beautiful type of patience that Allah Azza wa is mentioning in the Quran. So some people started asking, they said, well, wait a minute. We know that the scholars say the, the proverb, Sabr Ayyub, that the patience, the beautiful patience of Ayyub. But didn't we learn from Surah Yusuf? That the patience, that Yusuf had a phenomenal amount of patience for everything that he went through, right? So some people start saying, well, who had more patience? Was it Ayyub or was it Yusuf? And actually the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from asking a question like that. Such as what? He said, do not compare prophets with prophets. Don't head them up to each other. Each one was given their own time and their own fitna and their own test and their own... Uh, Completely different situation. Completely different situation. So to ask the kind of question is just not uh, fair in and of itself. Also, uh, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that we should complain to Allah, but not about Allah or from Allah. Like some people will say, yeah, you know what? Everything was going well. I was on my way. I got the oil change. I did this, I did that, and then boom, I got a car accident. Like, why me? That's very, that's, that's very, very dangerous. This kind of question of, well, why me? Versus the, the, the reward, just so you, everyone here knows, the reward, the ultimate reward is based on your immediate reaction. I see people do weird things, man, right? You see it, they stub their foot, and they start doing a weird thing like that, like they're gonna do something. I don't know, you know, and it's just, wow, you're just wondering, are they gonna hit somebody? What happened? Okay, alhamdulillah. Then you're wondering, what do you mean? Okay, khalas, then no, alhamdulillah. Guess what do you want me to tell you? They, they freak out and you just kind of want to move away from them. But if you train yourself, if you train yourself, you hit your foot and you're just like, alhamdulillah. It's a habit. It just takes some training. Just build it, build it, build it. Something happens, alhamdulillah. Just get it on your tongue, alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah, no matter what. No matter what. Every single time that reaction... And so the last thing to understand from this particular lesson is not complaining uh, from Allah. Especially when you're trying to look and uh, some people try to have a kind of patience that's practiced so that they gain people's uh, respect. You know, like, wow, look at what he did or look at what she did. This is also very dangerous. But we're never supposed to judge people like that, ever. The worst thing you could do is judge a person's intention. I think I mentioned this to you guys before. The worst thing you could do is try to judge somebody. Oh, I know why they did that. Because A, B, C, D. Why? Did they do something good? Yeah, they did something good. Alhamdulillah. Keep on, keep on doing good things. There's, it's not for you. Only Allah will judge an intention. You can't judge that. What we know is on the face of something. That's it. We don't sit there judging people's intentions. Why were they patient? Why were they patient? Things like that. And we shouldn't do things to praise people. Like I know a lot of people, they'll say, start saying, oh my God, this girl, she is the most patient girl I've ever met. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, throw dust at the people who overpraise other people. Not literally though, obviously, right? People carry a little pouch of dust with them. And what's that all about? Well, just in case. What? Well, I hear somebody overpraising someone else, so I'm following the sunnah. No, right? That's essentially... On them, ignore them, pay no attention to them. This is dusting people around. That's not good. that's not the way it goes. You see, sometimes you have to make an explanation of these narrations or people start acting weird, right? And the Prophet said, uh, he said, Oh, very important. He said that do not even overpraise himself. The Prophet said, Do not overpraise me the way that the the Christians overpraised Isa. Look at what they wound up doing. He was sent down as a man, and he was born a man, and he was sent to people as a prophet. He turned out to be God. That, that, how does that happen? That just doesn't happen overnight, right? You have to understand that very importantly. That's why you got to be very careful of what those steps are. How did they get to start saying, well, well, he was the son, and he was this and that? You got to be careful about overpraising people. Um,
And one of the scholars said, he said, I know nothing that destroys a scholar's work more than them starting to accuse other scholars of their intentions. So it's also very important for us that we shouldn't accuse other people of, oh, I know why they did this, 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 because you're diminishing your own good deeds. And so the final uh, statement, the final thing that we could learn from as well, is understanding that you can always, always turn to Allah in no matter what state you're in. Ayyub alayhi salam, he said he was willing to bear that hardship, that trial, before he asked Allah for, to, for the cure. He was, wait, he was willing to wait the amount of time of healthy years that Allah gave him before he would ask Allah for a cure. So if he, was, if he got that sickness at the age of 40, for example, or 50, or 60, he was willing to duke it out for another 60 years before he asked Allah Azza wa Jal for a cure. That is, that is a high, high level of patience. But Allah Azza wa Jal said that the cure, Allah sent down the sickness and Allah also sent down the cure. So we can discover the cure. So that means you can seek the cure. That means it's from the sunnah to look for a cure. Very good, no problem. But some people, they say, you know, uh, and, I, and I've seen this. May Allah Azza wa Jal again protect everyone and if you know anybody who's Allah just give them a quick recovery, Ya Rab. I mean, uh, some people, they, they've been diagnosed with cancer and they literally turn to their family and they say, I want to sit down with you guys and have a discussion. And what's the discussion? I don't want to do the chemotherapy. I don't want to do A and I don't want to do B. If Allah just gives me another year, he gives me another day, he gives me another month, I'm okay with that, alhamdulillah. That hurts. We know that as people who are loved ones. Is that haram for them not to take the cure? No. You learn that from Ayyub. You learn that from a time, a situation at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. But if you took it, then absolutely take it. Only one very small case that some scholars say it's wajib for him to take it, but that's besides the uh, point. So this is some of the things that you, we, we learned very much so. And just so that I don't leave you open in, well, what's the small case? Because you guys are very curious, college people. So I'll tell you, and they said that if it is a man who is uh, the sole if he dies, there is no male members in his family or any type of system by the government to look after his family. Like literally, they'll just be beggars tomorrow on the street Then he needs to take the cure. At least try for it. You understand? Uh, so that's the only case that I've seen a single scholar mention where it would be wajib. Nonetheless, um, so we sit there and we learn a lot here. We learn that that these fitan, that these uh, these trials that were all given, um, being wealthy, having your good health, having the technolo technological benefits that you have around you, this is a blessing. This is a reminder to thank Allah today for these things. Really, it is, right? Uh, and then, and then maybe, maybe we train ourselves a little bit uh, for, well, for for the out the, the outdoors. You know, go camping, go camping where there's no electricity or running water or something like that. You'll be, and by the way, that's when those books of fiqh uh, help you out a lot. How do you wash yourself? How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you pray? What about the emblem? When is it allowed? When is it not? So this is where that ilm does really kick in. So I would urge you guys to get, uh, uh, you know, be in the habit to know, to, to be in a survival mode, to also know how to do that. And last but not least, never forget to thank Allah and also turn fitna is um, and always say I will be in a shaitan regime so the shaitan doesn't get to you the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said we'll end with this and see if anybody has any questions that the best gift a person can be given from Allah is patience that's an amazing thing to have never forget that does anybody have any questions no nah. uh, yeah I might have missed it earlier when we talked about Ayyub why wouldn't he ask Allah why, why, why would he want to wait that long? Doesn't Allah always encourage people to ask as much as possible? Yeah, one of his names is a chef, right? One of his names is the one who cures. Uh, the etiquette of Ayyub, he didn't want to feel like he was an ungrateful servant. What did we say about the fitna? The Prophet ﷺ, he said that Allah tests his servants in accordance with their iman. And obviously, there's no difference of opinion. All of the prophets, dispute that no alhamdulillah um so so the level that he's tested on he didn't want to seem like an 
grateful servant. That he had so much wealth, he had so much this, he had so much that. And this sickness that he got, that he immediately turns. He's just saying, Alhamdulillah, when Allah gave me that, and Alhamdulillah, when Allah gave me this. So that doesn't apply to it. So a regular person should immediately turn to Allah, though, when he... Not a regular person or not, because, uh, so just so you know, at the time, uh, Abu Bakr, when he got very sick, they asked him to see the doctor, and the doctor told him that, you know, you're getting gold, and try this, 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 so he said no. They said, what is it? Um, what, he, did, he refused to take any type of medication for his sickness, and he just, uh, he, he lived his life, and he, he passed away. But, so that's what I wanted to tell you. It's not wajib to take uh, cure, but you're talking about the supplication part. Yes. So the supplication part, the Prophet ﷺ said, obviously, if one of you are very sick, take your right hand, say Bismillah three times, and say, A'udhu Billahi wa Qudratihi min sharri ma ajdu wa hadr seven times over the area that is affected. Hmm? So that's a very important. So that is from the sunnah to turn to Allah. But there's also another sunnah of thanking Allah and not thanking, praising Allah for that situation as well. So you see, it's almost like you you th you, th you ask yourself, can can, uh, can you handle it, right? And maybe you could for a little bit until you can't take it anymore, and then you say, you know what? I'm just going to ask Allah to cure me, and then you, uh, you you know you do it. So essentially, what the best thing to do is always say Alhamdulillah for whatever situation Allah uh, gave you, and then if it's in pain that essentially you're not bearing or is very difficult, whatnot, you make the dua, which I just mentioned to you, right hand, Bismillah three times. أعوذ بالله وقدرته من شر ما أجد وأحاذر seven times and then uh, so that you could, Allah Azza wa Jal could cure you and then if you wanted to turn to med medicinal things that are out there a lot of times unfortunately we turn to the medicinal thing before we turn to Allah so be careful of that it's not that uh, they contradict it's just that you have to make sure that in your iman that you believe that maybe Allah Azza will put the cure in that Advil or put the something, whatever that is. So, Very important. Yeah. So if you're ill, it, do you get more edged if you wait it out for a bit before you make du'a for shifa or if you make du'a for shifa immediately? And so it seems that you can get more edged by saying Alhamdulillah for the state that you're in. And the, Ibn Baz uh, was also of that opinion. Shaykh Ibn Baz. Allahu Akbar. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, sold. أقول لك أولها أستغفر الله لكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا الحق وتواصلوا الصبر أو صلى على محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين. And just don't forget, study hard and may Allah Azza wa Jalla make you all successful in your finals. Hopefully you all get A's straight across the board. And we will reconvene next semester, in sha Allah, with Tafsir Surah Al-Kahf. جزاك الله خير والسلام عليكم. أخ، ما قاعد.